Brownian initial data. That says you take a Brownian motion on one side and zero on the other side. For some bizarre reason, you can do the integration. So that case we can do now. <laughs> so there's some magic formulas still to come, that's for sure. Okay. Another thing which is definitely not in this picture. Yeah, in fact, it's sort of the same thing, which makes you, it's just the old trick happens to work here. In fact, it works this, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's because the, those, the, the way that that trick worked used other solvable models, which we can also do. Okay, the, the right image, so they, two time formulas. Well, you're gonna hear, this is an advertisement for Ji Peng's talk this afternoon. Two time formulas, wow. As you can imagine, to get a two time formula out of this, you have to take the chapman kolmogorov uh, uh, equation and integrate over almost all internal variables, over this enormous space of internal variables. So of course, the formula you get is useless. And yet they get simple closed form two time formulas. So, so it's not really something in this picture. But I'll tell you something else which, oops, which is in the picture. Can you hear? Okay. Here's another important process, which is that um, you just take the KPZ fixed point and you differentiate the NX. Okay. Now, okay, I, maybe you don't like that because it's not differentiable, but you can take a distributional derivative. There's no problem. It's a linear operation. So, so you get a get UTX which is a, a distribution valued Markov process. It's not completely obvious it's Markov because you may have lost some information by differentiating, but it is. it is. So this is a distribution valued Markov process which is the stochastic Burgers fixed point. Fixed point. And just like H is dying to be the solution of D T H equals, well, it's actually a quarter, uh, D X H squared. This, this is sort of the equation for H. You can't prove it. Um, U is supposed to be the solution of D T U equals uh, D X of a quarter U squared. Okay. They, they are some sort of weak solution of that, though nobody can prove it. But on the other hand, the, the, the one amazing thing is that we can compute u, we meaning the community, not particularly our group. This is actually known in equilibrium. So, so u, uh, h has almost invariant Brownian motions. They're not, you get to take a two-sided Brownian motion and then later you see a two-sided Brownian motion, but with some shift, which is supposed to be this by grains distribution. But u, should have invariant white noise. Okay, so let's take this and calculate the space-time covariance in the equilibrium process. So you start this U with white noise, and that's supposed to be the invariant process for this uh, stochastic Burgers fixed point. It, it exists, it's a thing. Now, of course, it is far from obvious that this formula makes any sense whatsoever, because these are distributions, but in fact it does and it's equal to t and minus two thirds. This thing called the KPZ scaling function, t to the minus two thirds x. And this just comes from an old calculation of uh, Ferrari and Spahn. So this FKPZ scaling function, I won't write it down. It's, it's, a, it's a function which is a lot like the formulas for the polymer endpoint distributions, which uh, Daniel was writing uh, yesterday. So it's just a, some crazy formula full of area functions. So this was computed by uh, Ferrari and Spahn. Maybe also a little bit in a paper of Praha for Spahn. Okay. But, and this just comes out because they had computed this for the space-time covariance of TASAP and it just scales. So they, they, that's their scaling limit of space-time covariance. So the, the thing existed in the literature before, and it was just waiting for the process to exist to have its, uh, that covariance. Okay. okay. 
So the last thing I want to do is um, talk about the, the, um, the uh, time, how it changes in time. Okay. So we talked about um, the space regularity. So the space regularity, it's, it's, it's basically looks like a Brownian motion in space, at least locally, right? So if you start from some initial data, it's going to produce a Brownian motion version of that initial data. But now we're interested in the time regularity. Okay. Yeah. Not in the picture, in the picture. So uh, space time area sheet, the area sheet. That's coming. <laughs> yeah. You keep anticipating. <laughs> just wait, just wait five minutes. Okay. So time regularity. Oh, I erased the, um, so, so it's invariant under this KPZ123 scaling. And from that, it's not too hard to guess what the time regularity is. So the time regularity is, you should, you should see that H uh, uh, T uh, plus S X minus H, uh, I'm probably going to change my notation later, S X should be about T to the one third. That's about how big it should be. So you expect it to be, you expect it to be a little bit less than Helder one third in time. Okay? So let's try to prove that. Okay. But to prove that, um, you need some variational formulas. And so this goes back to what uh, Pierre was talking about in his lecture a few days ago. So variational formulas. guys are hungry for lunch and I keep stopping you. So I'm going to skip a lot of the, I'm going to give you a simple derivation. Okay. At the level of TSEP, one has the following property. Suppose you start TSEP with two different initial datas. So, so now I'm writing the initial data here. So uh, F1, and now I just take the max of F1 and F2. So I have two functions, and I start TSEP. Well, they have to be fair functions for TSEP. Okay, of course. We, we know what functions you can have for the TSEP height function. Suppose I take two functions, and I start TSEP with the max of two functions. It turns out that that's equal to, and I'll, I'm going to have to qualify this statement a lot, so don't start asking me questions too fast. <laughs> that's equal to the max. from the two initial data. Okay, so TSEP has this wonderful property. It preserves max. Now, 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 now I have to qualify this. Okay, so what does it mean to start TSEP with two different initial data? We never really talked about that. So the problem is the right-hand side of this thing actually, in principle, doesn't make any sense at all. Because you start from some initial data, and you start flipping guys down. And the two things are flipping fights, but the flips have nothing to do with each other, right? OK. But of course, you could start TSEP. So TSEP, at every site, there's a Poisson process, Px. And the thing flips down at rate the indicator function that you see that there, OK? And, and makes a flip of size 2. And so, so minus. That's actually the rate of TSEP flipping down, right? You start with a Poisson process at your site. And that process, Poisson process rings. And whenever you see one of these guys, that's what the one this guy means, you flip it down. OK? That's, all, that's, that's the rate of TSEP. So in, in dh in TSEP is just that. Okay? But what it means is that you can take the same plus on process for TSEP starting from two initial data 
and run the two on the same Poisson process. Does that make sense? Okay. So just take the same P's. Start with two initial data and run the thing. And now it should be completely clear, if you think about it for 10 seconds, that if you start with one profile above another, that's preserved for all time. Because there's no way one can flip down below the other one. It just can't happen. That never happens. Okay? So if one's above, it stays above. Okay? So that's called the basic coupling of TASEP. You need a coupling. You need a coupling in order to be able to even say the right-hand side. So the basic coupling of TASEP is just use the same Poisson processes. And then this is just the property I just described, actually. Okay? Just the fact that if you stay above, you start above, you stay above, is just that property. Okay? But that's not true in ASAP. That's true in ASAP. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's true even in finite range exclusion. You, you, it's, it's a general fact about, about exclusion processes. It's true in KPZ, yes. Well, I mean, proof it's true in ASAP, so it's true in KPZ, because KPZ is just ASAP, right? Okay. Now, <laughs> is it true in the KPZ fixed point? Well, yeah, because it's the limit of TASEP. But the problem is I had to use the coupling, right? Now, once you couple the two guys, so now we take two initial data for TASEP and now try to take the limit, okay? You can take the limit of the coupled process because you know that they're both tight. Because we have enough information here to show tightness. We even showed that everything's, you know, I, I didn't say it, but we know everything's uniformly held or as, as you take the limit, so there's no problem. So there's tightness. So you get two copies of the KPZ fixed point with, um, you know, with this property, okay? The problem is you don't have uniqueness because of tightness. All you could use is tightness, so you don't know uniqueness. So I'm going to keep talking, but just keep in mind, we don't know uniqueness at the level of trying to couple things. So this is because Markov processes, when you talk about them in terms of their transition probabilities, are missing something for when you write things like stochastic equations for them. Stochastic equations basically couple all initial data, and so it's a stronger thing than just the Markov process using the transition probabilities. So we have the Markov process using transition probabilities for the KPZ fixed point, but the coupled things come to us in a soft way where we don't know uniqueness anymore. Okay. All right. So, so the fixed point has this property too. So, and the fixed point. But with the caveat that I just talked about, modulo uniqueness problem. Okay. All right, so that tells you, so let's, let's get a formula from this. So of course, if you, if you can couple two points, you can couple three points, you can couple four points, so I can couple a billion points and I can put a fine mesh of little narrow wedges everywhere and then you get the, the following formula. This is for the fixed point now, H, T, X, H, zero is equal to the soup over y of h t x starting from a narrow wedge at y. Okay, is the notation clear? There's a narrow wedge at y there. Um, plus h zero y. Okay. This thing here For every y, it's a perfectly good process in x, but in x, it's a rather ungapachkit process in y, because what you had to do, if you had a thousand y's, you had to do that coupling a thousand times. Okay. And I'll call this thing t to the one-third a 
of t to the minus 2 thirds, because of the scaling, a x t to the minus 2 thirds y minus a parabola. So minus x minus y squared over t. Okay. That's that, that, if you put these scalings of x's and that, you would get the same thing. So you can just think of it as a hat, if you like. Okay. So this a x y is a two-parameter process. In the first variable, it's a nice stochastic process. In the second, it's a little bit mysterious. Okay? And it's not unique. We don't know it's unique. This is called the Aries sheet. And this variational formula tells you, in a sense, how to solve for any initial data as a variational problem using this sheet. Okay? Now, the variational, it, it looks bad because in, in why it's so horrible. But on the other hand, because of time reversibility, AXY and AYX are the same thing in distribution. So it's actually just as good in Y as it is in X. And so the only problem isn't this, the fact that it's badly constructed in Y. The problem is you just don't know it's unique. Okay? So modulo uniqueness is a perfectly good formula. And the statement says something bizarre, which is that even if you don't have uniqueness, any Aries sheet gives you this variational formula, which gives you the KPZ fixed point. Okay? So, so the only thing is I shouldn't use the word the. It's not the area sheet, it's an area sheet. Okay. All right. So the, the problem with this, you might say, ah, well, why don't you just compute the distribution of the area sheet from the KPZ fixed point formula? But what does the KPZ fixed point formula tell you? It's going to tell you exactly the following thing. Suppose I wanted to know. Suppose I had two x's and two y's. So I had the area sheet at xi, yj, ij equals 1 to 2. So I have four points of the area sheet. And I wanted to know the joint distribution. So this should be a four-dimensional distribution, right? The KBZ fixed point formula tells you exactly the following thing. And if you think about it, it's just, it's just precisely this. It says that area xi y, j. Actually, let me put hats on them. So the hat just means that you subtracted the parabola. Okay, that's a common notation here. Okay, so it's, it tells you exactly that that thing is less than or, no. Okay, in general, it tells you exactly this. You can compute that. For any f and g, you can compute this. This is exactly what the fixed point formula tells you about the area sheet for any f and g. So if I put I get that, so you get that information. But here's something a little bit surprising. If you check the span of that in four dimensions, it's only a three-dimensional space. It's not obvious. So it's a three-dimensional linear subspace of four dimensions. And so you actually do not get the information of the area sheet. Okay. So you don't know uniqueness of area sheets. Okay. So how is all of this useful? Okay, all this sheet stuff. I said I wanted to prove this. Let me show you that the proof of this is very easy using this area sheet technology. So one thing you do know, it's easy, is that um, the ARI sheet is an ARI process in each coordinate. Okay? So in, in X, it's the ARI2 process, and in Y, it's the ARI2 process. That's not enough to characterize it. So it's the ARI sheet in analogy to the Brownian sheet being Brownian in both coordinates. Okay. But you could write this formula, hgx equals soup for y, very 2y, minus y squared. Oh, oh, sorry, with t's. Uh, t to the 1 third, t to the minus 2 thirds, y squared over 
kt plus h zero y. Okay, there's a variational formula. That's a variational formula which uh, Pierre wrote down, so I want to actually discuss it for just a second. Um, that's the variational formula, but I'm missing the second coordinate. Okay? So that variational formula is true for each x. But it's not true as a function of x. So this formula gives you one-point distributions of the resulting object. But if you want this thing as a process in x, you need the whole sheet. Okay? So that's the missing information. But I'll just use this formula to prove the time regularity. Okay. So we want h of t plus s minus h of s. Okay? T is positive, and let's suppose that s is positive. T s greater than zero. Okay? I can't prove the time regularity for any UC function for s equals zero because initially it's actually false. Okay? Especially if you start with a narrow wedge, you can see immediately that it's going to be false. The time regularity is that the difference is can be infinite. Okay. So because of the Markov property, I could assume that I'm starting with HS. So I might as well just take H T minus H zero, but h zero is a kind of function which I get at time s, but at time s I already know that I have a function which is Helder, Helder uh, beta, beta less than a half, so h zero, sorry, h, there's, there's an x here, of course, and so h zero is Helder beta less than one. But my shift invariance of the whole process, of course the whole process is shift invariance, so we might as well just take out x equals zero. x equals zero by shift invariance. So now let me just write down the formula. We've got h t zero, h t zero, yeah, is equal to soup over y of t to the one third of an airy process t to the minus 2 thirds x minus x squared over t plus h 0 of x uh, y. Oh, this is soup over x. Sorry. H0, x minus h 0, 0. OK. So that's the, that's the variational formula, right? Now, this guy here is locally a Brownian motion. In particular, it's how the beta beta something less than a half. So this thing here is less or equal to c t to the one third t to the minus two thirds x to the beta, right? Because it was Helder. Um, plus. And this thing here is, is Helder one beta, so this is x to the beta. Okay. And and I, I you can you can center the a. Yeah, sorry. I I, I can write minus a zero. Sorry, I should just. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I sort of realized that myself as I was writing it. It doesn't matter in the calculation because you you can take that out of both. Okay. Okay, anyway, so, so, um, so there's that, right? And now you just do the variational problem. And you immediately see that the soup appears at, the soup is at um, x is about t to the minus 1 over 2 minus beta. Sorry, it's at 2 minus beta. And, um, and the soup and gives t to the beta over 2 minus beta. And as beta goes up to a half, that thing just goes to t to the 1 third, right? So beta equals 1 half minus delta just gives 
um, beta over two minus beta equals one third minus delta prime. So, but that proves the time regularity and, and it's, it's a stop. <laughs> Questions for Jeremy? Yep. Yeah. So I could just uh, maybe say a little bit more. Like, what would the solution of the uniqueness problem look like? I didn't quite understand like, what the mistake was. So the problem is, as far as I can tell, and I would love to be told otherwise, <laughs> if someone has any idea, there's no way to prove uniqueness for such objects except to compute their distributions because we don't have an equation for them. Okay? So the only reason we know uniqueness of the KBZ fixed point is because I can give you a formula for it. Since I can't give you a formula for two coupled KPZ fixed points, I can't prove they're unique. And that's just that. Any other questions? Okay, one yeah, more. Devar. Could you talk a little louder? Can you turn it around to the variation No. No, there's no dual variational formula. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay, and last, last question. Yeah. So why does Well, the, you know, the, the, for the stochastic heat equation, it's, it's a quarter in time and a half in space because it has this one, two, four scaling invariance. It's the same thing. And this has this one, two, three scaling invariance. So it's a half in space and a third in time. It's kind of clear from the scaling that it should be like that. Okay? Okay. So let's all thank Jeremy again.